no one's saying you're stupid or incapable or a terrible person if you need to seek help for this stuff. You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 42. In this episode, I speak with Jeff Zuckerman, who holds master's degrees in both social work and journalism from the University of Minnesota. He has been a social worker, a newspaper reporter and editor, and for many years the director of the Writing Center at Walden University. He was a reviewer of the APA Style Manual 7th edition, and over the past 25 years has edited more than 1,600 dissertations in the behavioral and health sciences. Because he has talked with literally thousands of doctoral students about their writing, I am so excited to have him on today's show. He is also the author of Unglued, a bipolar love story, his 2020 memoir about the turmoil of caregiving and self-care following his wife's diagnosis with a late onset mental illness. Jeff, welcome to today's show. Hi, Heather. Great to be here from Minneapolis. I wanted to start today with this concept of why academic writing seems to be so challenging because I say all the time, to my students, listen, you're not alone. This is a practice and we all struggle with it. And you have talked to thousands of doctoral students about their writing. What do you have to say about that? I think one of the first things that students have to get in their heads is that it's a foreign language. Even if you're a native English speaker, it's a foreign language that you have to learn. And if you're a non-native speaker, in a sense, you're learning even another foreign language. It's not a natural language that we tend to speak. It's very formal. That's strictly built on standard American English rules that not everybody talks that way. And it's almost a cultural kind of, of language that we have to learn. And it's it's extra hard if you've never been exposed to that language. For a lot of students, it's hard. It's not fun. And so why would we do something that's not fun? What's our motivation? And how can we get better at something that's not even fun to begin with? Well, I do have some ideas about that. And I have some ideas about why it's so hard for everybody. I will often say, look, this is clinical, tends to be dry. It's very concise sometimes I will say things like what you just wrote was so enjoyable for me to read, but it's not academic writing. Yeah, we could argue about that because I have read a lot of academic writing that is not necessarily dry and students can put their heart into it and it still be scholarly writing. But as far as your writing voice, making it fun and taking the dryness out, I I would submit that The reason that it's so hard and that it's so foreign is that there are so few good models out there of enjoyable, passionate social science writing. And everybody ends up modeling bad writing. And for three editions of the APA manual, I would say they're trying to break that mold. And get people to tune into what a strong writing voice is. Just because it doesn't have a lot of adjectives and adverbs doesn't necessarily mean it's boring. You can use first person and the subject matter itself can be something that you have a passion for. And I'll say one more thing. When you're reading journal articles, does any journal article ever excite you? Do you ever step back and check out a journal article and think, wow, this was really readable. I liked how this guy wrote. I like how this woman wrote. I liked how these people, wow, it's their voice. They were speaking to me as a reader. They were conveying their ideas in plain English that I could understand. How did they do that? What is it? And then try to emulate that as your model instead of this boring stuff 
that's dry as cornstarch. Recheck that. Okay, nice. Jeff, I love that you're calling me out on this because I will say, look, it's okay. You're a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. Just make it more clinical. But you're arguing, Heather, no, stop the madness. There's a better way here. So when you're reading journal articles, when you find one that kind of lights you up, wow, that was an enjoyable read. I want to write more like that. I have two questions for you. One, do you have any examples or is this really just a personal thing? And then two, how do you develop your voice? Well, there's a terrific book. I've been doing this now for more than 25 years. And when I first started, I read a short, powerful book called Writing for Social Sciences and the author is Howard Becker. It is the best book on social science writing. And this guy is a big time sociologist. What he said, we have to take out of our writing. Greek fed polysyllabic bull****. And yeah, just don't write that way. Get, get rid of the bullshit in your writing. I did have Dr. Sean who said, we have this tendency to think if the more complex we write, the more academic we're being. Is that what you're talking about here? Kind of just simplify it. What are you really trying to say and say that? Yeah. Yes. We'll put this book in the show notes, Writing for yes. the Social Sciences. But when you're having chats with dissertation students who are struggling with this, what are some of the tips or tricks or techniques yeah. you use? Here's an answer to that. I model it as an editor or as a teacher. I model it by sometimes revising sentences. And I have, I have a knack for this. It's just one of God's few gifts that I receive. I can take a 20 word sentence and reduce it to six words. That's what I can do. And it's six straightforward words. As an English teacher myself, I have always said to students, find the best verb because mm. verbs do the work in a sentence. And for the most part, in social science writing, adjectives and adverbs don't do very much at all. So at a sentence level, find the best verb. At a paragraph level, think about the meal method. It really simplifies your task. The main idea, just a topic sentence. What's this paragraph about? What's the evidence to support that topic sentence? Analyze it. And then a lead in into the next paragraph. It's called the meal method. And that's all you have to do. That's a paragraph. Main idea, evidence, analysis, a lead in. That's at a paragraph level. And then at even a broader level, I'm a big headings guy. And using headings as an outline. That's how I'm organizing my paper, my literature review, my entire dissertation is based on the headings. So... First and foremost, you do have an amazing superpower of reducing a complex sentence to fewer words. And I will often say, read your paper out loud, because sometimes your ears are going to pick up things that your eyes don't see and ask yourself, do I need every word in this sentence? It's funny you should say that because just before we went on, I checked in my copy of Microsoft Word. I'm late to this and maybe everybody knows it, but in the review taskbar, there's a button called read aloud. You can vary the speed and you can listen to any Word document that you've written. And I use it because I hear mistakes in my own writing. I can hear the flow sometimes, but for sure I can hear the mistakes. I can hear when it, something's just boring and you can have the computer do it, which is a lot less exhausting than trying to read it out loud. Plus, we can listen better when we're not talking. Just listen to your own writing. You know, I must be late to the game, too, because this is the first I've heard about that. I love doing these shows. Every guest brings something that I didn't know. The review taskbar button called read aloud. So we've got let's make things concise. We've got the meal method. And this use of headings, it's so true. I will say Start your table of contents ASAP because you can just look at the headings and see if you're telling a coherent story. I like that. I like that you just use the word story too, because if your students are writing a dissertation, a dissertation is a story. One of the people I learned from called it a mystery story. 
where you're laying out a problem, you're giving the reader information about it, and then you're solving a mystery. And that's how a dissertation is constructed. And then at the end, you say, well, what does it mean to have, to have gone through this mystery? Um, one thing is when we hear about headings, sure, that, that sounds good. But I don't know if they're still teaching in grade school, junior high, basic outlining. And when I was a kid, we learned you start with a Roman numeral one, and then you have an uppercase A, and then a B. And then if there was something below that, it was like a, a little I, like a Roman numeral one. So th that's how we learned outlines. Well, that's all that headings are. Headings are kind of an outline without the Roman numerals and the A and the B and the C. Some universities have a template that includes the headings, at least the major headings, and that's a roadmap. It's a roadmap to get through the document, through the literature review, and you use APA style headings, level one, level two, and level three, as your roadmap. One other thing about the overall structure, you're driving your dissertation, you're driving from New York to Los Angeles, let's see. There's no need for you to go to Montreal and then down to Ar Argentina. It's not on the way. Just drive straight from New York to Los Angeles. Direct route. Stay on the interstate highways. If you want to put some color in, sure, you go on some of the, the old you know, U.S. routes or something like that. But mostly you, you want to get there as fast as possible. And you said figure out your outline or your headings and all that stuff ahead of, ahead of time. Sure. Great. Be open to changes. Don't be glued into it. You have a roadmap. Things get in the way. You get distracted. You decide you're going to go somewhere else. Okay. That, that's, that's all part of it. That's writing. It's called a rough draft. It's called a draft for a absolutely. reason. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I totally agree with you. Hey, your chapter two, those headings may change three or four times because the more research you do, the more writing you do, you'll realize, wait a second, this actually makes more sense here, or this can fit under here now that I've developed this paragraph and revised it. Maybe talk about the difference between oh, yeah. your role and what the chair and the committee's doing. Huh. That's an interesting question. In, in essence, 1600 faculty have said that to 1600 students that I've worked with, that, you know, you need an editor. And I will say that editors need editors. And when I published my book last year, I had two very good editors and I'm an editor and they improved it immensely. Now, as far as the faculty wanting an editor and what we're looking for, it's different. Yeah, at a line by line level, that's an easy call. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the um, reviewers of the APA seventh edition. So I, I know the nuts and bolts in a way that this is some, like nobody in their right mind should know the APA manual as well as I do. And for sure, faculty members, they have expertise that I sure as heck don't have. I can help you know, people like editors can help with that. There's also something, though, about substantive editing. And it's a, a variable line in here. It's not clear where, as an editor and a reader, I'm asking questions and wondering about stuff where I'm not a content guy. But it kind of is content, at least to the extent that I'm not following your argument and I can't understand your language. And I have questions about, let's say, how dated your sources are and just the flow of the writing, the repetition, and if there's inconsistencies. Now, it could be that the faculty member has read it so many times they're missing that stuff. It could be that they're just not good at reading with that kind of an eye. They could be so focused on the content that they're missing that stuff. And sure, we all need editors. I use a lot of comment balloons and ask a lot of questions. And I'll say, I didn't understand this, or is this what you're saying? Or sometimes I'll revise a sentence. I'll say, is this what you meant? You know, sometimes it's just fix, I fix stuff. But that, that part in between the 
fixing and you know, content. That's the art and craft of doing what I do. Yes, it's an art and it's a fine art because I know as a chair, everything that you said resonated with me. Sometimes I have read a document so many times now I've lost sight. Sometimes I will say, I think because I've had phone calls with you conceptually and content wise, you've got a strong foundation here, but it's not being articulated. So you need to work with an editor to help what's in your head come out in words that are clear and concise. Yeah. And like I was saying before, and that's a process. The students might have writing centers where they can get free help like that. And I don't know at every university, the extent to which they can get that. Part of that is we're not saying, no, no one's saying you're stupid or incapable or a terrible person. If you need to seek help for this stuff, that's yeah, you need help. Go get some help and get another eye in there and help you. And it might take more than one draft, but that's normal. We don't learn stuff the first time around. The first time we try making a souffle, it might go like that. It's just, you know, it might be a disaster. Well, okay, get it takes some practice. It's a new skill. That it has is. to be learned and practiced. And I love that you said as an editor, you used an editor for your book. Yeah, more than one. There were three in all. Look, my first draft was 120,000 words, I think. It was ridiculous. It was like 400 pages long. I knew I had to cut it down. So she helped me cut. The final thing I think was 85,000 words. I couldn't, I could not have cut those 30,000 words on my own because I thought they were perfect. Yeah. Fascinating. It was way too much. It's so hard to edit our own writing. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between an editor where you're kind of doing the just, I'm fixing things for you, substantial editing and writing coaching? Is that a thing, would you say, as an editor? Or do you just have the two categories kind of basic editing yeah. and substantial editing? I know what you're talking about. In terms of a writing coach, there are times, this woman who I'm working with on her literature review right now, man, I've seen like five drafts and she's just so resistant. That's coaching, just making these gigantic overview kinds of decisions with the students. What do I need to do? What am I trying to accomplish here? I know that some writing coaches also do weekly check-ins, more traditional kind of coaching where you're really pushing and inspiring and holding students accountable in a way that the chair might not be holding you accountable with deadlines or whatever it takes. We're all different. And how can we work together to motivate you? Because it's a hard, lonely process writing the yeah. dissertation. Unless you have a writing group, man, it's hard to motivate yourself. And a writing coach, you can pay somebody to do that. So there's this concept of kind of the fix-it editor, then a more substantial editor. How would a student know which one they need needed? Or do you think it's the role of the chair to say, hey, get a substantial editor? Well, one thing is just the feedback that you're getting from the chair. And is the chair telling you at a sentence level, are you missing the boat at a sentence level on just the clarity in your writing? And maybe it's stylistic if you're new to whatever style manual you're using. I'm not assuming all your students are social science students. But if, are you sticking to the manual? That's at a sentence level. More substantive is what I was talking about before in terms of overall structure of a section and is the f overall flow through the document. and Kind of the logic and the coherence, how it's all hanging together. Yeah, consistency, coherence. Yeah, I like that. And I like the idea of coherence. Yeah. You know, there, it's not always one or the other. You know, here's another thing. Is your language precise? And that's something that can go between substantive and line editing. And that goes back to what I said about adverbs and adjectives. Is your writing precise? APA style, I, one thing I like about it, it's science writing. So science writing does need to pr be precise. So you are, you're not going to say, I'm going to interview a, a bunch of people, and, or I'm going to send a survey to some people, and they'll work in business. Well, that's not precise. So there's also precision in language too. Editors can help with that. There's a, a couple other things I want to mention about hiring out. 
One is that just like I showed you a button that you didn't know about Microsoft Word, there are lots and lots of tricks in Microsoft Word that editors know. I can do things in Word in 10 minutes. I mean, literally, to build a table of contents for me takes 10, 15 minutes from scratch. Students tell me, I work, Jeff, I work on this for two hours. And look at what, I, it's a mess. So it's just knowing how to use Word, that's one where I'd say, oh my God, just hire somebody, spend a hundred bucks and have somebody do this and keep yourself from having a nervous breakdown over Microsoft Word. And that also goes for tables and figures, which are really hard to do and put in APA style if you don't do that all the time. You asked me about writing coaches. Yeah. And is there a difference? I have sometimes worked with students in a content course prior to the dissertation, and I've made comments like, you might want to consider working with a writing coach before you get to your dissertation because it'll make the dissertation a lot easier. But maybe what I'm saying is the same as a substantial ed editor. As you were saying that, I was thinking... Well, that depends on what your definition of a coach is and what you expect for a coach. I know of a highly paid coach. Whew, does she make a lot of money? It's expensive. I'll tell you that. And she does weekly check-ins and it's very individualized. And it's also determining what motivates you. Any coach, it's how can I push you toward your goal? How can I help you? define what your goal is and remind you this is why you're doing it and what are your challenges and setbacks this week at that level of coaching some people need that and it becomes an investment will you save so much tuition and aggravation in your marriage by having somebody other than your spouse or whoever push you and, you know, for some people, it's an investment. That's such an interesting concept because as a chair, I think part of my role is what you just described to be the coach. And I remember having a student, she was at the proposal stage and she submitted something. And I said, wow, I love this new addition. She goes, oh, my coach suggested that. And I wow. have to admit, my first thought was I'm not good enough, but I reflected back on our time together. And I thought that's why she's so efficient. And that's why she got through so quickly because I wasn't reading 10 versions. We had every other week check-in, but they were very quick. They were very efficient. She was using this coach in a very synergistic way where she got through the program and the allotted time designated by the university with a stellar project because she had this outside help. Well, I, I suspect you have more than one or two students. Maybe you're teaching classes and that's a lot of work for you. And, you know, as, as a faculty person, you can't do this 24 hours a day. I think what's becoming really clear, the more and more of these episodes I do is that it really does take a village from who's supporting you at home to your yeah. peers, to your coworkers, but you've got a chair, you've got a committee, you might have a coach. It might be a writing coach. You might have an editor too. You might have a dissertation coach and an editor. The team could get pretty big. Yeah. And I think one of the hardest things about being a doctoral student, it's, it's lonely. It, and it's not even real because once you're publishing, you're publishing with co-writers. You're a team producing that article. And maybe some people are doing more than others, but you're motivating each other. You're giving each other feedback. You're solving problems together in a way that as a doctoral student, I mean, it's a goofy model because in life, we're on a team at work. We're, we're with other people. So I think, especially for distance students, you might have to work hard at finding that team. I'll say one thing else about that, because I know you, you like talking about the psychology of all this, is that it's harder if you're naturally introverted yeah. to assemble your village. I always tell students, you can't be shy. You can't be a pain in the ass, but you can't be shy about seeking help when you need help. Yeah. And even if it's a little uncomfortable, go to the edge of that discomfort because yeah. it might mean the difference between finishing or not finishing. I mean, that sounds a little extreme, but it really can be. Heather, as long as we're talking about this, can I mention that I think one time you told me that not a whole lot of people are going to read your dissertation when you're done with it. And I, I know it's a, it's a start, 
to a career. It's not the finish line. I think doctoral programs tend to attract a lot of type A students. <laughs> that um, is for sure. That is for sure. I'm sure that all the listeners are nodding their heads right now. And so, yeah, as much as I said, it's not a great time to be an introvert. It's also perhaps not a great time to be a type A person, to try to be a little bit less type A. Because I say, now this is me, and maybe this is why I don't have a doctorate, but good enough is good enough. And it's figuring out what's good enough. And going back to our original conversation, why do students struggle with this? Because they're trying to write the perfect sentence. They have in their head this perfect document. They want to get the Nobel Prize for social science dissertations. Good enough is good enough. Jeff, you just hit the nail on the head. I did a podcast oh. with Dr. Shaw, who said the best dissertation is a done dissertation. Yeah, and I think yeah. we don't talk enough as faculty to students and say, hey, did anyone tell you this is just a demonstration project mm. to demonstrate that you have a certain skill set to the university? This isn't your submission for the Nobel Prize. This huh, isn't your that? life work, right? All right. I, can't, I, I know what I'm talking about. I guess it's you do. It just amazes me. Okay. But I love that phrase, good enough is good enough. And your faculty will tell you when it's good enough. And if you're spending time in this loop of trying to make something perfect, it might be time to stop the madness and get some feedback about where you really do need to make changes or not. So Jeff, you've dispelled my myth that scientific writing is always dry and boring. And we're encouraging people to go out there, find the articles that light them up and emulate that, right? Yes. Yes. And you taught us the meal technique. We've talked about the importance of an outline that needs to be nimble and flexible. I always think of Gumby. Be Gumby during the nice. dissertation, right? Nice. I like it. Gosh, so much about editing, assembling a team. Another thing is, I don't know if you've talked with your other guests about reference software and citation software. Briefly, and everyone has their own opinion, so I'd love okay. to hear your recommendations for that. I know that Zotero is highly recommended by a lot of people. It, I, it, I, I think it's a free one. It doesn't solve your problems. You still have to put all the information in correctly. It might make mistakes, but if you hate commas and italics and parentheses, if you hate that stuff, I hate, I hate fixing my washing machine. I hire a guy to fix my washing machine. So if you hate it, just use some software at least to get started. So before we wrap up, I'm wondering if you have any final words of wisdom for students or the faculty or maybe yeah. a favorite inspirational quote you want to share. Yes. Listen, there are some people who have beautiful teeth who go to the dental hygienist once or twice a year, they floss all the time. The creator blessed them with great gums and teeth. And they love taking care of their teeth and they're good at it. I go to a dental hygienist at least four times a year. It's painful. It's bloody. It's a mess and it's embarrassing. They don't guilt me so much as they used to. Some of them used to guilt me. And I would feel bad about myself. And I would and I say, this is the time I'm going to floss every day. I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm going to be good at it. And <laughs> I come back three months later. Some people, writing is like mouth care is for me. We have our things. We need help. Sometimes it's a little embarrassing, especially if I have to go to a periodontist. But you know what? I got to have good teeth. I, I got to have my gums have to be good. So I get help. I seek out help. And I've learned I'm not a bad person. And that's how our writing is for some people. So the take home message here that I'm <laughs> that I'm hearing is <laughs> if you need help with your writing, it's not a reflection on your goodness or your badness. It's just an indication that, hey, maybe that wasn't the gift you were given. Get help. It's not a big deal. And we all need to see the dental hygienist at least once or twice a year, the best of us. That's right. 
Jeff, I had so much fun chatting with you today. Thank you so much for taking time Anytime. and sharing your pearls of wisdom. Be sure to check out the show notes for a link to the book that Jeff talked about, as well as a link to Zotera and other handy resources. As always, you can find direct links to everything my guests talk about on my website, expandyourhappy.com. Just click on store and then resources. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. The Happy Doc Student Podcast is brought to you by expandyourhappy.com and you can learn more there. Oh, and hey, if you want to make my day, would you rate, review, and subscribe to the show? It would help me get noticed by more people like you, people who know there is a better way to navigate the doctoral process. One more thing, just a quick reminder that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only.